So my name is Grace Higgins. I'm the senior project manager for our physician advocacy network here at Twin Cities Medical Society. And presenting with me today is Dr. Pete Dinell. Uh, he's the medical director of our physician advocacy network. And he's going to talk a little bit more about our project and our work later in the presentation. So I'll leave that for later on. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, if you are interested in receiving continuing education credit, we will mail out the certificates once you've completed your evaluation form. So be sure to fill out your evaluations after the presentation. And if whoever, I think Rebecca will send us the evaluations and then we'll have your email addresses to get those directly to you. And at the end of the presentation, we welcome your questions in either in the chat box or you can ask them with the microphone either way. So today we're going to cover a few different things. We'll identify and describe current trendy tobacco products like e-cigarettes. We'll identify the specific health and medical risks associated with them. We'll talk about current tobacco cessation recommendations and how e-cigarettes fit into those. And we'll also give you some strategies to talk about these products with your patients and their families. So looking at the e-cigarette trends here in Minnesota. E-cigarette use is actually at an all-time high. The Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey data was just released last month and found that almost one in five high school students has tried an e-cigarette in the past 30 days. You can see that's significantly higher than all other forms of tobacco at the moment. When we look at the trends over the past seven years, you can see that Cigarette smoking rates have been declining since the year 2000, and they continue to decline. Uh, and here on the graph, you can see that they're at about 10% among high school students. Whereas e-cigarettes, the first time we had data recorded on e-cigarettes was in the 2014 Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey. And we see that they've actually jumped since then and are sitting at about 20%. Uh, as far as other tobacco products, you can see that smokeless and pipe tobacco has declined and cigar use has had a slight increase in use since the 2014 data. And we're not entirely sure what is the cause for that. And we do know that they're available in a lot of flavors. So it's not surprising that they would still be a popular product. When we look at high school student use of e-cigarettes in combination with conventional tobacco, we see that about 60% of high school students who are vaping are also using conventional tobacco. So the, the risk of going on to be a smoker of conventional cigarettes is quite high with e-cigarettes. When we also look at the dual use of marijuana and e-cigarettes, the Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey for the first time asked this question in 2017 and found that 35% of high school vapors also vaporize cannabis in their vaping, e-cigarette vaping device. So we don't know if this number has gone up or down, but it, it is an alarming statistic to see that that many high school students are vaping and using marijuana. With regards to adult e-cigarette use, in Minnesota, uh, similarly about one in five adult Minnesotans have tried an e-cigarette at least once. What's interesting about that data is that not all of those individuals are smokers. So you can see here that about 12% of them had never smoked a cigarette. So these are actually new tobacco users. And some of them were actually former smokers. So they had previously decided to quit and took up e-cigarette use after quitting. 
So now I'm going to give you just some more information about these products in general and what you find on the market. E-cigarettes go by a lot of different names. You might hear them called vapes. Now, most commonly among high school kids, we see Juul is a brand of e-cigarette that we're seeing is a lot more popular. They look like a little USB stick and they just charge in your laptop. Normally we have samples of these products to pass around. Uh, so today you're missing out on the live experience of e-cigarettes, but I would encourage you if you're interested in learning more about these products to step into a vape shop and just get a look at what, what they are. Um, they're, workers in these shops are always happy to talk more about the products and it gives you an idea of what kids are using and what the appeal of them might be. Another name you might hear is e-hookah and in the literature you'll hear, hear them referred to as electronic nicotine delivery systems. They all have three main components though. You have a battery to charge the device, the atomizer heats the liquid nicotine, and the tank is where you would store the liquid nicotine. And those are refillable in these, the types that are pictured here. So they have evolved over time, e-cigarettes. A lot of people I think are most familiar with the first generation version that was actually looked like a cigarette called a Sigalike. And these were low single voltage devices. They had the liquid nicotine already inside of them. And they were usually disposable. You'd buy them in a gas station and throw them out when you're finished using them. And then with the second generation, we saw the products evolve so that now they're refillable with liquid, liquid nicotine. You have adjustable voltage. You can recharge them using a USB charger like your cell phone. And these devices, a lot of times we see more often in vape shops specifically or tobacco shops. With a third generation, these bulkier devices called mods, you see a lot more flexibility for the user to be adjusting the voltage and the wattage. And a lot of the appeal of that is in order to, for people who wanna make big smoke clouds with their vaping device, if you can adjust the voltage and the wattage, then you have more control over your cloud creation abilities with these devices. They're also rechargeable uh, and you, these are predominantly what you would find in a vape shop and they have different interchangeable components that you can mix and match as well. Another aspect of the more evolved vapes is the ability to track your usage on an iPhone or a smartphone app. And a lot of these apps kind of market themselves as quitting apps. So on the screen here, I think it tells you how many days you've gone without smoking a cigarette in theory. Uh, it tells you how many puffs you've taken. It, it, it just allows you to track data uh, as you're using the device. And on the left hand side here, you can see these are actually the jewels that I mentioned that are popular in high schools. And on the left hand side, you can see that there are different skins that kids can buy to put over the device so they can personalize their e-cigarette, uh, which I think lends itself a lot to the marketing tactics, especially for young people, because you can see they're colorful and very appealing. So where are high school students buying these products if they are not legally available to someone under the age of 18? Most of them are getting them from someone they know. So 74% of high school kids said that they got them from someone they knew. And about 65% of that number is from a friend. So, and the rest of that would be family members. So most of the time they're getting them from acquaintances or friends. Another concern here, we see that about almost 20% of the time, someone in high school is getting a vape from, directly from a vape shop. So that's concerning because it tells us that we need to be increasing our regulation of vape shops and 
uh, compliance checks on who they're selling to. I was surprised to see that these numbers are so low on internet sales because whenever I talk to high school kids, I hear a lot that they are getting these devices online. You can see here on the screen, there's this is just an example of a pop-up window that you would get when you go to buy the product online. Uh, you can see it just asks you, are you 18 or older? Yes, no. And then you can get into the site. So it was surprising to me that only 7% are getting them on the internet. People always ask, how does the cost of an e-cigarette habit compare to conventional cigarette smoking? So here's a cost comparison for a pack, pack a day habit. Conventional cigarettes here in Minnesota could cost upwards of $3,000 a year. Whereas if you're using a first generation disposable e-cigarette, that, that number would be cut in half. And if you ha have a third generation e-cigarette habit, then that number could be cut even further to less than $1,000 a year because you can recharge it. They're, the efficiency of getting nicotine is increased when you have these more advanced devices um, and you can mix and match different concentrations of nicotine. So it costs much less than traditional cigarettes. The e-liquids themselves, we see them come in many, many, many different fruit and candy flavors. In 2014, there was a study that found that there were 466 brands and 7,764 7, unique flavors on the market. And I'm sure that number has just grown exponentially since 2014. These are just some examples on the screen. So you can see a Fun Dip candy flavored one, banana milkshake, uh, donut flavored, etc. And interestingly, studies of e-liquids have found that some flavors actually have higher toxicity than other flavors, depending on the chemical components that are involved in creating a flavor. So it's, it'll be interesting once companies are required to report the chemical contents of these products on the label, uh, I think it will give consumers more power to understand and limit their exposure to the chemicals that are found in flavorings. And these on the right, you can see that it's referred to as liquid nicotine, e-liquid, e-juice. Um, they come in these little small packages pictured here, and they also come in more larger containers now because more commonly we see lower concentrations of nicotine but higher quantities of the nicotine for sale when you go into a vape shop. Like I said, nowadays I think more, most commonly we see three to six milligrams per milliliter of nicotine for sale in a vape shop. With the evolution of devices there they're more efficient than they used to be. We used to see high, higher concentrations of nicotine available, but now that's slowly decreasing. One of the problems with e-cigarettes is that they, the FDA has not enforced the reporting of nicotine content on the labels for e-liquids yet. So whether or not the accuracy of the nicotine content is valid is still in question. That won't go into effect until later this year, I believe. And this is the reason why some, a lot of, especially young people say, oh no, I'm not vaping nicotine. I'm vaping any liquid that doesn't have any nicotine. But really at this point, you, you can't be sure of that. And we know from studies in the past that nicotine content reported on the labels actually was not accurate. So because the FDA isn't enforcing this, we really can't trust the nicotine that's being reported. And that's where the statistic comes in that 99.6% of e-cigarette products actually being sold do contain nicotine. So whether they say they don't contain nicotine or not, we know that most people end up using nicotine when they use these products. Not to mention the abundance of chemicals, like I mentioned, that are found in the 
e-liquid. So propylene glycol kind of gives it that liquid consistency that is required for the product. We also see chemicals found in antifreeze, formaldehyde, and any number of other chemicals that while they are approved by the FDA for human consumption, this is the first time in history that they're being heated and inhaled directly into the lungs. So we don't know what the long-term health effects of that heating and inhalation will be on the human body because it's never happened before. And interestingly, a lot of studies are starting to find that if the chemicals, depending on how hot you're heating, the e-liquids themselves actually has an impact on the toxicity and the health risks that are posed. So it's better to advise that if someone is using an e-cigarette, that they shouldn't be using it at very high temperatures because that does increase potential health risks. Obviously, ideally, we would hope that they would stop using e-cigarettes. So despite all of these unknowns about what the long-term health effects will be, and Dr. Donnell is going to speak about what we do know about the negative health effects of nicotine, these products continue to grow in popularity. One of the reasons, obviously, is that the tobacco industry has been marketing addiction for decades. And as you can see here, this chart compares past 30-day e-cigarette use with dollars spent on e-cigarette advertising. Obviously, as advertising dollars go up, so does youth e-cigarette use, because these are the pros. Where are they being advertised? Unlike conventional cigarettes, e-cigarette ads are still allowed on TV, whereas we have not seen conventional cigarette ads on TV for decades. So this is from the 2017 data. You can see that almost 40% of high school students had seen an e-cigarette ad on TV. More commonly still, about half of high school students have seen ads in stores themselves and also on the internet. We see a lot of social media advertising nowadays, especially for young people. These are just a couple of examples of those ads. So on the right, you see an Instagram ad. Those are little ice cream cone e-liquid containers on a vape shop's website. And on the left, just recycled tobacco industry tactic. It says more doctors vape than use traditional cigarettes. So go and get your blue. When we look at the timeline of regulation of these products in the US, they really haven't been around very long. So about a, a little over a decade now, they were invented by a Chinese pharmacist and they first came on the US market in 2007. And sales were not restric restricted to minors in Minnesota until 2010 and they were not restricted across the country at the federal level until 2016 when the FDA deeming regulations were put into effect. And in 2014 here in Minnesota, we included e-cigarettes in the Minnesota Clean Indoor Air Act. So statewide, you will find that e-cigarettes cannot be used indoors in schools, government buildings, libraries, all public facilities. However, Cities and counties can restrict indoor use of e-cigarettes even further, so restrict access in bars and restaurants. And here in Hennepin and Ramsey County, we have those restrictions, uh, but most of the state actually don't have, does not have as strict of restrictions as we do here. Child-resistant packaging laws were put into effect in 2015 for e-liquids. Dr. Donnell is going to talk a little bit more about the risk of nicotine poisoning for young people. And in 2016, the FDA deemed e-cigarettes a tobacco product so they could officially be regulated similarly to cigarettes. And also the U.S. Surgeon General released a really great report about the risks to young people in 2016. So the FDA deeming regulations, like I mentioned, came into effect in 2016 in May. 
And in August of 2016, sales of e-cigarettes in vending machines were restricted. There were no longer free samples allowed and you now had to be 18 or older to purchase e-cigarettes. In May of this year, we will see nicotine warning labels required on products and advertisements. So like I mentioned, until May of this year, there's no requirement that nicotine content be recorded on these products. So of course, it's not surprising that high school students are going around saying, oh no, I'm not using nicotine because it's not even required to be reported on the packaging. So and in August of 2019, we'll have to wait until then for harmful and potential harmful constituents. So all of those other chemicals that I mentioned will not be required to be re reported until next year, unfortunately, uh, because that is a expensive and lengthy process to determine what all chemicals you are letting people inhale into their lungs. When we talk about other tobacco products that are popular with high school students and high school and middle school students here in Minnesota, flavored products in general we know are very popular. About 70% of all current youth tobacco users has used one flavored product in the past 30 days. And flavored cigarettes were banned in 2009, but we still see these little cigarillos, hookah, chew tobacco, e-cigarettes, there's still an abundance of flavored products available on the market. And youth are six times more interested in those flavors of e-liquids than a tobacco flavored e-liquid. So the candy and fruit flavors are a lot of the appeal of these products. And we hear from school staff and teachers that they, a lot of times they don't even realize that young people are using these products because they don't smell like a traditional cigarette. They do just smell like a kind of candy vapor in the air. You wouldn't, if you had never smelled one, you would have no reason to think that someone had been using a tobacco product. Menthol flavored tobacco, on the other hand, we still have menthol flavored cigarettes. This is the only flavored cigarette that's still available on the US market since 2009, which conveniently has sparked the popularity of menthol cigarettes because they really soothe the throat when you're smoking and they make it much easier to smoke, especially for someone who doesn't have a taste for the harshness of tobacco in the first place, which is why menthol cigarette use now exceeds non-menthol cigarette use since 2014. And unfortunately, the tobacco industry has put a lot of work into targeting menthol products at marginalized groups, African Americans, the LGBTQ community for many, many years. So we do see unusually high rates of use in the African American population. For example, we know that about 88% of African American smokers are using menthols because of this targeted effort to get them addicted to menthols. And at pride festivals, tobacco companies will often be handing out their flavored products at LGBTQ events. Hookah is also very popular among high school kids. About one in five high school students has tried hookah. We know that because it is more of a social smoking device, when you sit to use a hookah, you can see in the diagram here that there's a pipe and a mouthpiece and you would sit with your friends indoors and pass around the mouthpiece. Sometimes you could be sitting and using the device for an hour or more and inside. So you are exposing yourself to significantly higher levels of smoke than you would if you were using a traditional, just smoking one cigarette outside. And, and shisha, the tobacco that you use in a hookah, contains nicotine. It is a tobacco product. It contains, it poses the same risk for addiction that any other tobacco product would as well as the carbon monoxide exposure because you use a small coal 
to heat the tobacco on the top of the device. We usually have a demonstration of this as well. So if you're curious how a hookah works, I encourage you to YouTube it and get a better understanding. Uh, because you fill up the bottom with water, there is a, a misconception that that water is filtering out any harmful components of the tobacco, which is of course false. Uh, you're still being exposed to nicotine and other chemicals in the shisha tobacco. And if we look at harm perceptions of these products among youth, we do see a trend that youth are perceiving flavored products and newer tobacco products as less harmful than conventional cigarettes. So we found that 38% of middle and high school students believe vaping causes little or no harm. And 19% of middle and high school students believe hookah causes little or no harm. And when the risk for addiction is so high and the unknowns about many of the chemicals in these products are continue to be present, these are really concerning numbers when we talk about youth tobacco use. And with that, Dr. Donnell is going to speak more in depth about the health risks of e-cigarettes and nicotine in particular. Thank you, Grace, and uh, hello to everyone. And uh, thank you for your interest in this topic. It's, it's one of those great opportunities for tobacco companies. The, uh, the, uh, uh, when um, e-cigarettes were first developed, it was much more of a cottage industry with small businesses making these products. But the um, tobacco, large tobacco companies have since really uh, appreciated the, the business opportunity and the, the model for increasing their, their customer base, uh, ad addicted customer base, I should say, going forward. So it's one of those things that it's it very much a uh, concern for us and the Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey just confirmed that we have a rising population of a um, customer base for the tobacco companies, which will have to work really hard to learn how to stop their nicotine addiction. And when we're talking in this space, we, we are truly talking all, it's all about nicotine at the end of the day, um, in terms of the, um, of, of why these products are so popular and why people get addicted to them. The, um, uh, when you say nicotine or tobacco or, you know, e-cigarettes, it's, it's all very much a synonymous sort of uh, terminology because the, the purpose of e-cigarettes, as it is with conventional cigarettes, is to inhale nicotine into your body and then have it get to your brain where it has its effects. Um, when, you, when you look at um, kind of the uh, different uh, components of an e-cigarette, there is much that we don't know yet in terms of the health effects. We do know a lot about nicotine and we do know a lot about conventional cigarettes. We've had literally decades of study to show how the effects of, of cigarette smoking can um, harm a person over time. We do not have that same level of evidence in terms of e-cigarettes. Uh, there are a lot of assumptions that you can make. There's probably some extensions of the literature that apply really quite well. Certainly when you're talking about nicotine and its effect on the body, that's all very solid information. But because of the um, uh, combustion of uh, tobacco in a conventional cigarette is different and it's higher than with an e-cigarette, um, we don't, we can't say that, well, it's exactly the same as a, uh, a we can't say that it, the e-cigarette is exactly the same as a conventional cigarette. Um, and, and that's a matter of discussion. People ask, is it safer with an e-cigarette than a conventional cigarette? And there, there may be some components which are less harmful with an e-cigarette. We don't know that from a research standpoint, but there are other potential harms with an e-cigarette that we don't see with conventional cigarette, especially with all the flavorings and other additives they add to it. Um, you are still heating a product, you are still changing the chemical configuration of that product, and you are inhaling it directly into the lungs, where it can then be distributed broadly to the body, in addition to any specific um, uh, adverse effects on the lungs itself. For example, with one of the major components of e-cigarettes, which is propylene glycol, it is uh, it's anticipated that that is going to cause a lot more in the way of pulmonary fibrosis over time, 
But with, with many of these health effects, you're looking at a 25 to 30 year latency period between the time of, of initiation of any of these products and what you're finally seeing in terms of its overall health effects. So stay tuned, um, but we do know a lot of the extraction that happens of uh, nicotine from tobacco brings a lot of the other uh, harmful substances along with the nicotine that are then inhaled directly in the form of an e-cigarette. So, like I say, please uh, please stay tuned, please follow the research, but there's still a lot to be known, and, and well as well as just time to figure out what happens with people over time with the use of these new products. Um, at the end of the day, nicotine is nicotine is nicotine, whether or not you, um, you get it through a conventional cigarette, through a hookah session, through a, a pipe or a cigar or with an electronic cigarette. Basically the idea is, and this is why it's so, uh, so addictive, is that you um, get it into the bloodstream in some form and when you're doing an e-cigarette as you with a conventional cigarette, you are literally, it's a 10 to 15 second um, length, uh, time delay between the time you inhale something, you get it into the alveoli in the lungs, they go directly to the left ventricle and then directly to the brain. So you're talking like a, a 10 to 15 second cycle time between that, which is uh, something that a lot of us uh, didn't realize until we got started getting into this work. So it's really a direct, uh, a, a direct effect in that way. But you're then getting a, a substantial amount of nicotine, which is higher than what the body is normally designed to produce internally, that gets to the, uh, the brain receptors. That causes, a, some people will say, an upregulation in the amount of nicotine that the, the body is confronted with. The body will then increase the amount of nicotine receptors that the brain is working with, which then create an ongoing need for a higher uh, amount of nicotine within the body over time because the brain really likes nicotine. It stimulates uh, the pleasure pathways within the dopaminergic um, pathways within the brain. The brain really likes it. People who spoke really like the effect. I, I have to fully acknowledge that. But at the end of the day, you're in an, an, an addicted situation because you then are physical, physiologically um, dependent on a higher amount of nicotine than what you had been in the past. So it, it's a big deal. And it's something that a lot of us don't necessarily recognize before looking at this uh, concept a lot more closely. The um, Minnesota Department of Health has some definite opinions about nicotine. It's far more harmful than what we think. Um, you know, and, and most of us who've been around for a while grew up with people using cigarettes. And if that number of people are using cigarettes, it can't be that bad. That's similar to what it is with the e-cigarette space now. With high school students, they say, hey, you know, it's it's, it's just vapor, or it's not nearly as much nicotine as what you get with a cigarette. Again, there's a lot of misinformation out there, but at the end of the day, it's a highly addictive substance. Um, it does affect the brain development in, in adolescents higher than what it does in adults, just because the brain and people don't stop developing until the early 20s. And so the, the brain in an adolescent is much more plastic and much more malleable, if you will. And so the need for nicotine is much higher going forward if you use a lot of this during the teenage years versus uh, the adult years. Um, and it does all the same things that, that nicotine does in pregnancy and with the um, um, effects of poisoning and any toxic effects that you see with, with nicotine in general. So it's not, a, it's not a harmful or benign, I'm sorry, it's not a harmless or a benign product in any setting. Um, and especially when you're thinking about pregnancy and young children and the potential exposure that we see with, with those groups in particular. The, um, you know, if you look at the body-wide effects of nicotine, other than what it's doing with the brain, it does all those same things with, with the vascular system. It increases heart rate, increases blood pressure. It, it's an additive effect to the vascular injury that happens with diabetes. Um, it it uh, adds to ad additional component of insulin resistance with diabetes. So there's a lot of very adverse effects. We are, we are experiencing a, a record growth in the number of people with diabetes. They will have long-term health effects from their diabetes, which will be made worse by any nicotine use or exposure that they have in their lives. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, the impact on the brain development is much higher with, uh, with teenagers than what it is with even 25-year-olds. Uh, 
And that's why tobacco companies have found that it's incredibly important to secure their customer base well before they're legally able to buy these things. It's, a, it's an important area. And I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious there, of course, because of course, as physicians and healthcare professionals, we need to especially target adolescents to help them not ever to start using this product in the first place because their brain will get used to it very quickly. When you think about um, tobacco use in pregnancy, thankfully most healthcare professionals recognize that nicotine with pregnancy is not a good combination. Well, that same sort of uh, nicotine exposure has to be extend extended to any little e uh, uh, cigars, uh, cigarellos, uh, uh, hookah sessions, and then certainly with e-cigarettes because nicotine on placental circulation is not a good combination. And it certainly does all the same things that nicotine exposure during pregnancy with tobacco use in any form uh, takes place. When you look at uh, nicotine as a uh, potential poison for young children, it's, it's actually a very potent poison. Um, you only need one milligram per kilogram of body weight of biologically available nicotine to kill a person 50% uh, of the time. So the LD50 for nicotine, to use that term, is one milligram per kilogram that is effectively absorbed into the body, however that is, however that is done. And nicotine can come in through any mucous membrane. It can come in through the skin, and that's why the nicotine patches, for example, are so important in the, in the cessation treatment. Um, but if you get a, a little um, uh, three-year-old who finds a bottle of e-cigarette juice sitting around, which may have a concentration of 10 milligrams per milliliter of nicotine, and you look at anywhere from a 10 to 30 milliliter bottle, you suddenly have a, a toddler who potentially could consume in one setting of anywhere from 100 to 300 milligrams of nicotine directly into their intestinal tract which is uh, likely to kill them. Um, certainly we see the, the number of childhood poisonings, and this is Minnesota data that we see here. Um, and again, it's a very attractive thing for, for toddlers and young children to get a hold of and, and experiment with in their own form. When you look at national ni liquid nicotine poisonings, the number that are reported have, have certainly gone up uh, to a record high of, of over 3,700 back in 2000. Uh, 15. We have other numbers for 16 and 17. There, there is an issue with probably full reporting of that data, but this is what we have in terms of the cases per year right now. Still a substantial number of kids get exposed to nicotine that are then having symptoms of poisoning. So when you're talking with patients, this, is, this does require a little bit of expansion of the concept of tobacco use. Um, first of all, there, there is some misinformation that you may need to clear up with your patients if they are believing that e-cigarettes are a cessation device, if they're already using tobacco in some form, and they say, well, hey, I can use an e-cigarette and uh, work off of this nicotine addiction that I have. Um, right now, that is not an FDA-approved cessation device. Um, the e-cigarette companies did have a, an opportunity to go down that path, but they chose not to for a whole lot of reasons, including they didn't really want the FDA into their business at all. Um, there are a number of well-designed and well-delineated um, uh, programs in terms of tobacco cessation with other nicotine products, and I would recommend uh, using those. I, I'm not sure if I would get into a, any sort of a long discussion about, well, are e-cigarettes safer than standard cigarettes? There, there is some suggestion in the literature in just literally the last two months that some uh, medical bodies are starting to suggest that uh, we would recommend not going down that path because we really don't know. And as, as Grace was pointing out before, you do have a certain number of adults, and in, her, in this case, 11%, who uh, were never other forms of tobacco users who can still get addicted to this product as an adult will then uh, likely flip over into some additional or, or dual use with other tobacco products. And then you have 22-23% uh, of people who are former smokers. They've successfully weaned off their nicotine addiction and they're back using nicotine in some form. So again, it's, a, it's, it's helpful to stay out of that space entirely. 
U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. Again, there's current um, the current evidence is not uh, suggestive that that using e-cigarettes for cessation uh, programs is effective. Um, again, this is when you're starting to use uh, some approach to help your patients get off any sort of tobacco product. You really need to have the, the discussion that you know it's easy to get into dual use if you start using e-cigarettes or if you're using regular cigarettes and you use e-cigarettes that's not likely to cut down on your uh, standard tobacco use. Um, we do need to recognize that a lot of people who use tobacco products or nicotine products in any form do see a physician and we do really encourage people in the healthcare uh, professions to really work on tobacco reduction and inquiring about it. You will get pushback from some people, but again, if you take this attitude in a very helpful um, manner that we really are concerned about tobacco or nicotine use in any form, we really think it's going to impact your health badly, and we just are concerned about you as a person. That's a, a much different approach than what maybe some people have experienced where you are a bad person for still using to, uh, cigarettes or tobacco of some use. So again, it's, it's, kind of a, a, it, it's kind of a much more compassionate form. There's a, a, a format of helping to intervene in this space called mo motivational interviewing, which is a good way to really work with people in this space. But again, if, um, if physicians and healthcare professionals simply asked and advised people to quit their tobacco use, there'd be a higher quit rate, both in the state and at a national level. Um, there, there is a simple format. You ask, you advise, and you assist in terms of helping people reduce their tobacco use. This is not where you have to have a, a 30 to 45 minute discussion, literally a 30 second to two minute discussion uh, informing them of your concern about their health is likely to have a much bigger impact than ignoring the subject or that box and the medical record has been checked before, therefore I do not need to ask it again. Um, again, with, uh, with this whole space, you do need to broaden your language. And what I mean by that is that do you smoke? People will say, no, I don't use, I don't smoke, I don't use cigarettes. And they'll say, well, sure, I have some e-cigarettes and I, I, I go through about 10 of those, you know, in a, in a one month period of time or whatever the number is. And it's uh, one of those things where you really do need to ask in a broader sense about their potential exposure to tobacco, whether in the primary form or as a secondhand um, nicotine exposure within their household or in their, their the hookah bars that they frequent for a social gathering that's a, that is a f source of tobacco exposure, just to help them understand that. Um, and then if they have asked about, if, you, if they are tobacco users, then you can start asking, well, how many times have you thought about quitting? And most of the time people will acknowledge that they really have thought about quitting. And then, um, and then you can also go down the, well, what made you think about quitting? Is, it, is there, a, is there a, a health issue that you're having? Do you want to see your grandkids? Do you want to have all your limbs with your diabetes when you get to be 65 years of age? You know, it's little questions like that. Again, it's finding out what's important to them through a motivational interviewing format and then helping them to uh, make some steps towards reducing and hopefully eliminating their nicotine use over the long run. Um, we really, um, as Grace was pointing out, we are seeing a, 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 an impact in terms of the e-cigarette use amongst uh, the teenagers in our uh, state, and we really need to help them figure out a way not to go down that pathway and getting addicted. And um, uh, there are a number of resources that you can advise your patients, um, both from a health plan standpoint as a Minnesota quit plan um, access that they can have access to uh, resources that way. Within your, within your clinic system, hopefully you'll have some resources, including as we've seen with other clinics, they'll have, a, they'll have the tobacco specialist, they'll have the nicotine specialist, who if, if somebody is a little more interested in quitting their nicotine use, you can uh, rely on this person in a, in a broader sense. And again, it's not a, it's not a 15 minute discussion even, it's a 30 second to two minute conversation. Um, if they are uh, 
interested and concerned, it's very helpful within your clinic to have some really up-to-date and uh, well-formatted uh, cessation uh, tools and pamphlets and programs that people can have access to either within your clinic or as I was mentioning before, more broadly available on the internet. Um, you really need to know the risks and it's, there, again, these are just some of the um, information, information uh, materials that are available. You can have these both for your staff as well as within your patients for their, for their use. Um, some of this stuff is kind of fun that you can, uh, that you can get access to and it, it's, it's colorful and it's delightful and it helps get people thinking about, about this in a broader way. This is stuff that you can have in your waiting room. We're certainly having printouts available or, or directing them to the appropriate um, websites where this information is available. In terms of the actual assisting of, of patients, and this is where it's very helpful to have uh, a uh, process within your clinic where this information is available to all clinicians who, who want to help patients reduce and quit their nicotine use. Um, the gum, the lounge, and the patches are all available without a prescription. Sometimes there's uh, cost support with certain insurance plans, including the state-based public programs. The other ones are, are prescription um, medications. Again, some of these will be available without any charge to your, to your patients. There are other, um, in addition to the nicotine replacement therapies, which, in, which include both the patches, which are a long-term nicotine replacement therapy, as well as the, the gum, which is a short-term. That combination of nicotine replacement therapies is very helpful. Then you can also get into things like Shantix and Zyban um, in combination with the, the nicotine replacement products to have a very effective, um, to have a very effective cessation program within your clinic. It's, it's really helpful to get up to speed with, with knowing the current thinking about these different products. There used to be black, black box warnings on both Shantix as well as Iban, uh, which have been removed um, in terms of the, the potential psychiatric effects of these medications. But it, it's helpful to get up to speed. There was, was some thought initially that Shantix cannot be used in combination with nicotine replacement therapies, especially like the gum, but it, it can be used. And the current data suggests that that may actually be a little bit more effective for some people than just Shantex alone. Again, quit plan services are available to, to people within the state. www.quitplan.com is, uh, is what people would have access to. There are a number of policies that help to reduce the likelihood that um, kids and teenagers are going to take up nicotine use. There are a number of things that really communities can do and, and some communities are starting to go down this path just as they were back in 2004, 2005 with the kind of the forerunners of the Freedom to Breathe Act in 2007. So one of the things that you can do is to raise the tobacco age of purchase within your community to 21 years of age. That is likely to help young people from becoming smokers within the next 15 years. It's not suggested with, with the same Tobacco 21 initiatives to make, the, um, to make the possession of tobacco as an illegal entity. Um, that, that brings up a whole different kind of discussion, but for just simply purchasing tobacco within your community, people have to be 21 years of age, just like they have to be for alcohol. It's helpful to restrict uh, uh, tobacco uh, that's been flavored with anything, including menthol, to, um, to adult-only tobacco stores that reduces the availability of these products, again, which are easier to get addicted to than this conventional products in these same categories. Um, if you include the e-cigarettes within the indoor clean air uh, laws that you have within your communities, that's helpful. There are a number of communities and counties within Minnesota that have done that, but right now it's not a statewide mandate. Um, and it's recognized that the um, uh, inclusion of this is likely to start at a community level and then eventually get up to a state uh, inclusion, a statewide inclusion of uh, e-cigarettes within the Indoor Clean Air Act uh, eventually, hopefully. 
Um, it's also helpful to have prices um, high and there are some tobacco products which aren't so pricey right now that are therefore much more accessible to kids in terms of their, um, their nicotine um, use and uh, addiction with, uh, within the state of Minnesota. One of the things that we are doing here with the Twin Cities Medical Society, we have the Physician Advocacy Network. We are very happy to partner with communities that want to get into this space more. We certainly want to get uh, with physicians who would be interested in some training and, and maybe some experience with um, advocacy at their community and county level. That's something that we think is really important, uh, both in terms of the regulation as well as uh, nicotine reduction in the long run. Because there are just things that you know about your community that would help your community more than, than even what some of the things we've talked about today. So at this point, we are gonna turn it over for questions. And I'm going to turn over the control of this to Grace. <laughs> Grace, this is um, the Aiken Clinic, and there are no questions here. Okay, thank you. Can, can I just ask um, if there are um, clinicians um, within your clinic who are particularly interested in this topic or have a, if you will, a passion about reducing uh, nicotine use within your clinic or, and, and this can be um, a, a, a nurse, a physician, an advanced practice nurse. Is there, is there a point person, if you will, that would really um, like to take this on in more depth? Yeah, this is uh, Dan Schletti. Uh, I'm actually a certified tobacco treatment specialist here. I'm a health coach uh, <clears throat> as well. And I, I work out of our our, <clears throat> our three aging clinics. And so um, our provider group, they'll send referrals either to the quit line um, or we tend to get more, just we keep them internally and they'll make referrals over to myself. So we do have an internal workflow process in place that works quite well. And um, I guess just from my experience, I, I believe that a lot more patients tend to respond better to that face-to-face -face experience and having that one individual or individuals that can help support them at, on site versus the types of telephonic services. You know, just the logistics of it becomes challenging at times. Um, but uh, I don't know. And really, it just comes down to patient preference, though, too. So it's just nice to have a variety and be able to option option those uh, or give the patients those options when we're discussing sensation with them. Okay, thank you, thank you for that information. And yeah, um, we've we've seen in other settings where where there is a there is a uh, cessation expert or you know a point person that really seems to be effective. So uh, thank you for your work in that space. Uh, and like uh, Dr. Donnell mentioned, we do on our website, panmn.org, we have a number of resources on e-cigarettes uh, in a few different languages. So feel free to access those for your patients. The, the other thing that um, was alluded to with the Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey was the use of, of other, other products within the e-cigarette um, uh, mechanism. and. Uh, you can uh, not, I'm not recommending this, but you can go on to YouTube and to figure out how to extract um, cannabis from your local marijuana supply. So it's one of those things that is really, it's, it's not hard to do. It's just really basic chemistry. You just extract the, the good stuff and you, you heat it up and you inhale it. And the, the challenging is that um, back in the day, if people were using marijuana, you could, you could, in a good sense, people were smoking weed, but um, with the electronic products, it's probably not nearly as evident. Yeah, and Dr. Janelle, this is uh, Dan Schley again. 
just quick question. Do you have any feedback? So I guess in like primary care, you know, for like Minnesota Community Measures, uh, for like diabetes, you know, it, it, we expect them to be non-tobacco users. But from our, well, we've always been told there's not really a good definition of a non-tobacco user. I mean, do they have to be tobacco free for a day, a week, a month, an hour? Uh, not an hour. But I mean, like, a, I mean, what is the general, like, is there any kind of time frame that majority of people kind of go by with that? Um, Grace may have some other information, but usually the definition of a current nicotine user or tobacco user is within the last 30 days. That's a pretty standard definition. Okay. Obviously, the longer they can go without the use of, of nicotine products, um, it, the better. But it's, it's one of those things with, with diabetics especially, um, or anyone with um, cardiovascular risk factors, the, the, the nicotine is going to, you know, exacerbate their underlying vascular problems. Uh, you know, I don't know how many fold, uh, five fold, ten fold. It just depends on how much they use of, of tobacco or nicotine products. So I think that that's all the questions we have. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we'll get all of your certificates out once we have your contact information. And feel free to, if you have any follow-up questions, shoot me an email. There you go. And feel free to visit our website and take a look at all of the resources we have available there as well. Thank, thank you so everybody. much, Grace. Have a good one. Have